that sheared through those skateboards like a hot knife through butter. Effortless. Today I was lucky enough to have a nice Skype call with none other than Jeff King from Built to Shred, which aired on Fuel TV from around 2008, 2009 to 2012 when it ended its fourth season. I got to talk to Jeff a little bit about his life since the show, during the show, and some memories that he had throughout the four full seasons that they shot and also his injury. Thanks a lot for taking my call. It, it felt kind of weird because I haven't spoken to you except on, I think it was on YouTube years ago, I, I made a video and I... I asked if you could film us uh, an intro for a skate video we did back then for a company I used to write for called Six Sense. I don't know. You can't really see it on my own. We were so excited. It was like our first skate video. And back then we were all super stoked on Built to Shred because it was, I don't know, it kind of like normalized skateboarding for us. It was the first time that a lot of us felt accepted by the mainstream seeing that skateboarding was getting all this recognition there were tv shows about it it was in the x games we felt like yeah. we finally had a voice so we wanted to really make our video seem official and yeah. you were willing to send us a video and it i know it, it, it was like it seems small time looking back on it but at the time it was super epic and we were beyond stoked to have you on the video i'll have to send it to you at some point i don't know if i ever sent it to you yeah, it's, I'd like it's to nothing just, that amazing now. Well, you know how it goes. It's rad though. His yeah, no, it's super fun. So, yeah, you have you been like a lifelong skateboarder? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I, I remember having boards like way back. I had I got an older brother and 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 he surfed and skated and stuff. So I remember having like a Tony Hawk board. Probably wasn't. It was probably his, you know. But but I remember having one of those, and 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 even having one of those like penny boards, you know. Oh yeah. I was probably five or six or something like that. I remember skating back then, dude. I remember like going pretty far down to my friend's house, you know, on one of those, and it was before I could stand up, so I was like butt boarding and pushing <laughs> on the ground somehow, you know what I mean? But yeah, I remember they used to let us cruise around. Like, That's so cool unsupervised yeah. like oh, i'll be back later i'm five you know yeah no that's how it was for us too i i don't think there were any other skateboarders on my block but my neighbor was having a yard sale this was back in like probably 2001 2002 they were having a, a garage sale i remember they had stuff in their garage and stuff out in the yard they were selling a bunch of things and the neighbor had an old bart simpson like spoon nose huh. board right. and i knew hardly anything about skateboarding at the time i may have had like a like tony hawk pro skater on nintendo or something but that was all i knew so i saw that i remember i walked in there saw it instantly ran back to my house my mom was home for the day and i go mom 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 can i please have ten dollars or whatever it was probably like three dollars or something mom can i buy this skateboard of course being my awesome mom she was like yeah sure so I remember yeah. having that, and I did just like you. I'd butt board around the neighborhood and in the driveway. And from there, it grew into this obsession for the last 20 years, and it's never it's never worn off. I don't know. Do you? Yeah. What's, like, one of your first memories skateboarding? When you graduated from butt boarding to standing, what are some of the first memories mm -hmm. you have? I remember some, some old friends back in the day. Um, I was like, had both my feet on the tail and I grabbed the nose and I tried to like jump or something and I landed and my wheels went out from under me and I smacked my face on the ground. I remember, <laughs> I remember oh, that. <laughs> but not That's bad. So funny. I ground, but I didn't knock them out or anything like that. They just kissed the ground just a little bit. I remember that. Oh. Um, yeah, no, but for me, what, what really turned, turned, uh me to skateboarding is is I played soccer as a kid and and um I I kind of got burnt on it something about you know there was competitive soccer you know eight nine ten somewhere in there and then um I was getting burned out on it and I didn't make the team and I remember the coach calling me and taking the call and, and him telling me I didn't make the team or whatever and and I was like didn't I was like Cool. Like, didn't even bum me out at all for a second. I just hung up the phone, walked through the hallway, out the garage, grabbed my board, and skated away. 
And that was like, that was it. That was my, I was, skate, I was a skateboarder now. Before I was yeah. like, you have one around, you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, it's like, whatever. It's another one of the toys or whatever. But that was like kind of a turning point for me. It was like, no, I'm going to start skating. I'm not interested in sports anymore. Yes. And I think too, for a lot of us, it's the whole idea of there being all these rules with every sport. There's like a certain way you do it, a certain way you do this. You're always trying to get points. There's like an end goal. Whereas with skateboarding, it's super free form. You can skate without any goal. And I think lately, at least me getting older now, I'm I'm in my 30s and I'm trying to, I don't know, as much as I like having a goal, like something to achieve so I can feel accomplished, I almost find like that puts me in the wrong mindset and takes me out of just skating for fun. Did you ever find yourself kind of falling into that trap as a, young and upcoming skateboarder there's always people that are so much better oh my god and these days especially i watch some of these clips man and it's like untouchable it's untouchable but Insane. they're regular people but they're they're untouchable for like and i'm pointing at myself like like dude i don't think i could ever do that even when i was really good at skateboarding you know i'm really going for it and really like trying to do it like the level has risen so you know i suppose i suppose you fall you know when you're skating with your friends and your usual people and you build each other up you know yeah. and you get stoked and makes a 360 flip and he gets stoked when you make a 360 flip and you and you're working together and it's not really that that guy's better than you even though he is it's not really about that it's like about you know who's who's making the trick whatever it is it didn't matter you know and so but every once in a while you get reminders i remember seeing muska at a contest and like, he just was like, whoa, dude, seeing Sheckler skate in person, <sighs> seeing Sheckler skate is a, just a treat because you're like, that's how you do it. Okay. That's how you do it. Cool, man. And I got to see a lot of that with the show. There was a constant, um, constant reminder, you know, of like, nope, you're not that. <laughs> you're not that. You're okay at skating. Sure. You're okay at building and it kind of worked itself out and you got a cool little spot that you could be, but you're not that, you know, these guys come out swinging their first try tricks are my best trick of the day, you know? And so it's, you know, but it's just how it is. And so, and so in that sense, yeah, you do kind of want to like bring your own colors to the table, you know, and, and have fun with what you can do. You know, I've, I've had a, had a really good friend, a uh, fantastic juggler, um, Sean McKinney wow. back awesome juggler and um and he was capable of doing things that other people couldn't do because of his ability to contort his body into certain positions right like Jesse Hotchkiss incredible somehow I don't know how he can tweak his ollies and tweak his knee down and touch his board the way that he does and like, all the impossible is so sick you know and some people are just given more of those you know and so everybody has their own non-tricks though you know so so yeah you try to embrace your non-tricks try to try to work towards doing the really hard ones but you know the ones that come easy i guess as skateboarders it's a very physical thing not so much reliant on our strength so to speak but more on our flexibility and i think honestly for me skateboarding's always been like 99 percent mental it's your confidence it's your perseverance etc and I think that's why we can have 20 people, 50 people do an ollie and they're each going to look a little bit different. You ask each of them to do your best ollie, they're all going to look a little different. But you ask 50 people to kick a soccer ball, you'd have a heck of a time trying to pinpoint any difference in the way they kick a ball or the way they run a football down a field. Yeah, and, and so being able to play to your strengths is, is, is a big one and being confident in those strengths. You know what I mean? Maybe you were just gifted. Maybe you were given some cool drops, magical drops when you were born that could get you yeah. really good. You know, maybe you're that guy. And yeah, it's kind of 80s. and You're kind of stuck in the 80s. But dude, you can do those so good. You know what I mean? Yeah, so definitely. Like, it just kind of, you, you know, and being able to embrace that because maybe you don't want to be a guy who can do good, really good bonuses. I want to be a street guy. I want to be a ledge guy, dude. Nobody cares about bonuses, but it's like you were given that, you know, you that was attracted to you. You were attracted to those types of moves and your body allowed you to do them. You watch a day one video and you're like, are you kidding, dude? <laughs> what? Him and Everett's Haslam especially, he's uh, just like this 
he's I don't know. He's almost like uh, some mythical creature. Whenever I see him skating, especially like cheese and crackers back in the day, it was unreal. I've never seen him skate in person. Have you? Yeah, I've met him before. Um, and he's just like that. Super cool dude. Like in day one, too, dude. I met day one and I'm tripping on him. Dude, I skated with day one. I skated a manual pad with day one in our first built to shred at the water park. It was me and day one skating this stupid fiberglass slide. And he got stoked when I did like a nose manual 180 out or something stupid. And I'm looking at him and he was genuinely like, yeah, dude, that was sick. And I was just like, what? Like that was, talk about pressure, dude. Talk about like, what am I going to do? I only have two manual tricks. <laughs> and you want a nose manual, like, you know? So it's like, that was like, wow, that was, but, but it's so cool. You know, in Hoslam, we did something in uh, Oxnard or Ventura, some globe thing. They rented out some warehouse or something like that and i did a there was like a wall ride and i put one of those um ladders that you climb up whatever and he did like a hippie jump through it or something weird anyways um but he was cool he was like just had a really cool attitude not stressed like like down you know that was cool that's so awesome i love that so growing up skating for me especially i don't know this I'm kind of in a small town in Idaho. We don't have a lot of people here. I think we're a population of like 30,000. So when I was in school in the late 90s, early 2000s, skateboarding was really kind of not shunned, but people just didn't know much about it. And what they did know was like, oh, they're always breaking stuff. They're a bunch of drug addicts that want to get high and go vandalize things. So I... I found that skating was kind of like my voice where I felt like I could be myself. I wasn't some other kid on the field playing soccer, playing football. I tried all those sports, but nothing really felt like it was an expression of me. So I gravitated to skateboarding. And then as I started to get better going to the skate park, which I was super nervous to do as a kid, because you don't want to be like the one kid there that sucks while everyone else is doing actual tricks. So early on, I started getting a lot of hate from some of the older guys. And these were guys that I looked up to. But I remember one dude in particular would tell me, you know, the tricks would look a lot better if you just didn't do them. Implying that, like, my style and everything was just so bad, so ugly. And I remember that just, like, devastated me. But then there were other dudes that would, like, build me back up. They'd hear this guy. His name was Jeremy. They'd hear what Jeremy would say and be like, Dude, screw that guy. You're skating. I really like your your kick flips. I've always had tray flips decent. They're like, dude, you got a great tray flip. That dude, that dude, he's a jerk. Don't listen to him. Did you ever get any hate as a skateboarder growing up? Not hate, but um, I remember going to like going to McGill's skate park in Carlsbad, mm-hmm. and uh, we got there early. It was like. Peter McBride used to go there a lot. He would, he was good, dude. He, he, he had transition dialed. And this was the old wood one from the A Street videos. I don't know if you remember mm. those or, but this one goes back to like Hocus Pocus days and like, wow. You, you know, even before that, I think. And so I was, I was young. I don't know how old I was, 13, maybe something like that. I, I don't know. And uh, we got there. The ramps were wet. The older kids were on the other side of the spine ramp. I was standing on the deck. I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll just like ski in. I'll just I'll just step in and two feet slide down <laughs> the transition. You know what I mean? Kind of like kind of like rollerblade, but not with rollerblades on. You know, I'm just gonna step in, like slide down on so my feet, like. And I just stepped in and just zinged out and just <laughs> fell right back, only to look up and see like four older dudes pointing and laughing. <laughs> <laughs> like you just totally slammed in front of them, dude. And so I didn't really, yeah, I kind of like, you know, that was like one of my first experiences, you know, with the, with the skate park. And so I kind of was like, I'm a, more of a street guy, I think, which is unfortunate because I, I really think having transition skills is like, is clutch, you know, that's, I think you can skate transition for a long time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Skate- has has more of a lifespan on it, but I think you can skate transition for a really long time. And, and being able to just have stuff in your bag, five O's to fakie and, you know, long grinds and being able to be comfortable with that, you can do that till you're old, you know? So it'd be cool to know that from a young age, I think. Yes. 
Speaking of, do you have any sort of like mini ramp or anything at your house where you're living now? Yeah, but it sucks. I got it for free off Craigslist or something like that. And like it's eight eight feet wide, it's three feet tall. It's got too short a flat bottom. Yeah, it's not it's not good. You know, I just thought the kids would be psyched on it, but they don't even ride it that much. Uh, how old are the kids now, if you don't mind me asking? I got a six and a ten and a fourteen. That's cool. Do they all yeah. skate, or is it just kind of a whatever? No, so, they're into sports and uh, uh, water polo and soccer. Are, are those two guys, and then the the six year old just into whatever you know. As a six year old is. Yeah, he rips his scooter though. He's so good on it. It's crazy. You got this little three wheel scooter with the two wheels in the front, you know? Yeah. And he just he has a little longer hair and he's just rad style. Like it's just natural style, you know? It's cool to be able to see that. Yes, that's right. so cool. You never know what they're going to do, you know? So you just don't push it. No, you really don't. My, my girl's kids, she's got an eight year old and twin girls that are going to be six in February. And all three of them, the boy, he's definitely gravitated to scooters. He, I think honestly, scooters for kids, it's like a, I don't want to say an easy win as like to, to bash on them or anything, but I think as a kid, you need kind of the easy confidence to keep you going and skateboarding is not not super willing to give that to you without a fight, you know? For everybody, dude. And, and just getting some wheels and being able to learn how to, how to hold your balance and go fast. And, and that's another, that's another thing about those electric bikes, you, you know, we didn't have that kind of quick power, Mm-mm. you know, it's a whole other, there's a whole other thing happening, you know, but I think it's good for kids to be able to learn balance and have speed. And if it's on a scooter, whatever, who, whatever, dude, Well, even if it's on rollerblades, you're like, uh, you know, you know, but, but it's like, whatever, dude, if that's what you're stoked on, I'm not going to hate on it, dude. These days you can't hate on anything. Man. <laughs> no, you really can't without getting canceled instantly big time so yeah on that sense right there how could you hate on a scooter you know what i mean how could you hate on how could you hate on the bikes like it is what it is there's people that get in the way on all levels dude skateboarders get in the way all the time you know 100 percent. and and it's weird like you we go to skate parks and i remember growing up we'd like try to we'd bash on the scooter kids on the bmx kids whatever but as i grew up i realized you know what? They're out doing something. Ninety nine percent of people, they'd much rather be sitting at home playing Halo, whatever, not to hate on video games or anything. But very few people are actually out there doing the thing. And yeah. we should encourage that and embrace it. And that's something I've learned. And I wish I would have really grasped onto that concept years ago. Just thinking how many people that I may have discouraged from doing whatever sport it was. Just the yeah, thought of that makes me kind of like hate. <laughs> It's not their fault that they picked the wrong thing. (laughs) You're (laughs) You're right. But you're absolutely right, dude. They need to be, you know, there's, it's cool. At least they're out doing that. At least they got some wheels under their feet. You know what I mean? At least we can relate on that level. If we're on another planet and you run into a rollerblader, you can be like, what's up, homie? You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, what's going on, dude? We all ride wheels. You know, that's cool. No, that's so true. Yeah, there's common ground, dude. I, I I had you know I had some some good friends in rollerblading back in the day at the skate park. You know, we do doubles runs and like fly across the park and do all kinds of good stuff like that. Yeah, like, those guys rip, dude. Who ca- who cares? You know, they they rip, dude. It's all good. <laughs> you know, but back then it mattered. It was like, dude, what? Those guys, those guys suck. You know, it's like, you know, like, I don't know. That's hundred percent. No, it's not totally cool. Yeah. It's not, yeah. Inclusion. So you, so you grew up skating in California. Did you move around at all when you were in your younger years? Did your parents ever like move to another state for a while with you? No, mostly just Encinitas, Lucadia. Yeah, that's cool. Do you have a lot of experience skating in? I'm sure you've skated in a lot of different states, but are there any that like really stick out to you? Like, oh, I really loved skating in D.C. or something. New Orleans is sick. Really? You know, I've never been. What was that like? It's cool. The coolest people. I have, I have a good friend that lives out there and then made a bunch of other friends, you know, like, yeah, New Orleans is cool. And uh, Larry Blossom's down there. Just a cool scene. Like, I don't know. Sometimes the, when you get a, away from from like where the action's happening and it's just like, 
you know, they're not going to get the most they're going to get is like a shop sponsor. You know, you come out in, in Encinitas and you've got like all the companies are right here. The magazines right here. You know what I mean? All the guys who run the magazine, the whole video department of the magazine, the guy who runs that lives in Encinitas. You know what I mean? Like you don't have yeah. to, you don't have to really like, if you're going for it, it's a good idea to come out here and do that. But then, you know, you get into the roots of it and it's like, no, we skate because we want to skate. We want to get better. We're not trying to do it for the fame. So Definitely. That, and it's funny, like, that was like a common thing I heard growing up. It's like, oh, you want to be a pro skater? And it's like, well, I mean, that would be cool, but no. Like, we we had TV back then. I could see, we'd watch skate videos, and it's like, I knew these guys were levels beyond me, but skateboarding was a lot more than that. And I think it's hard for everyday people to grasp, like, oh, they're just doing it because it's fun? Like, that's kind of weird. Right, for sure. Was Built to Shred your, like, first introduction to, like, a televised sort of show? Yeah, I suppose it was. I mean, we did uh, we did little segments before that. It was called Create a Spot. Yeah. And that was on Captain and Casey. That was probably the first taste of it, you know. And then, and then um, Laban, who is the co-creator of Built to Shred sold his idea American Misfits to Fuel TV. Wow. And then in that package, they threw in Built to Shred. We took it from Create a Spot and renamed it and, you know, put some branding on it. Those guys, Laban and Ted up there, really knew what they were doing. And they would they branded it. And so then it was a part of American Misfits for two seasons. And in those two seasons, we did 13 segments per season, right? And that's when Dave Bergthold was brought in, was at the start of Built to Shred. So mm. it was Dave Bergthold, Ted Newsom, Laban Fidius, and myself. So when Dave came in, he brought, like, we had some, like, when we did Create a Spot, it was me and Laban, right? And we just had some really stupid ideas, cheap, like shoelacing a piece of plywood to a fence and making a wall ride, like silly. I don't know. I don't know. We just did a bunch of silly ones. And then when we got Dave in it, he actually brought like the ideas. He was like the visionary of it. He was like the, like he, he, he had it, he had it all. And now he did the editing, he did the filming. And then he would come up with like most of the ideas. Wow. Most of the ideas you saw in those first two seasons of segments were just stuff that his like, he's like, oh, we should do this. We should do this. And it was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. You know, and, and, and uh, yeah, he brought, he brought the creative, he brought the creative element to it on multiple levels, you know, cause he skates. See, I don't know if you know who that is. That was Berkthal, you said? Yeah, because blockhead skateboards. Did he kind of leave it up to you to put his idea into like actual construction, or did you have help with that? Um, no, because he's a builder too. Wow. Oh yeah, he would know how to build it, dude. He would know how to build it. Well, I'm really stubborn, and so I would do stuff and try to do it my way, and he would have to sit there and just deal with it. You know what I mean? Watching me just mess it up and mess it up, and then you know, and like. Yeah, so many times, dude. I'd probably drove him so crazy, dude. Insane. Did you guys butt heads pretty often? Um, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it ended in flames for sure. I yeah. I, really? Yeah. yeah. Um but his I have to give him like so much like all the credit, dude. Because even the even in the in post, in the editing, like I didn't know what to say. So I, he had to like skeleton. He had to like put all the things I said. It's crazy. I bet if somebody go back and watch some of those old ones, they'd be like, whoa, dude. He was doing magic over there. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's what I think really, really like helped set things apart, you know, is, is getting those cool ideas, you know, and, and, and making them, uh, making them come together. We did uh, um, a shoot with Larry Linkogel. That was a motocross guy. Wow. And we did this wall ride in Carlsbad. That was in season two, I think. Yes, yes. 
and he did a wall ride over the door, over a roll-up door on a warehouse. You remember that at all? Yes. So, so gnarly. Insane. He, he asked me to build this ramp for him, and I did it out of steel, and he wanted a wall ride ramp. And I built this, like, horrible quarter pipe thing that was like, I mean, it's in the video. It's like 20 feet wide. They used it as a landing ramp. Yeah. Right? And it's just this stupidest, like, you like you I but but it's hard to think motocross because you're like spatially you're like oh those guys are like 40 feet to my eight foot little seven foot little like bank to bank is yeah. 40 feet to them you know what I mean and so you just like you know and so I built this thing that goes straight up and down like what's he gonna do go straight up and turn 90 degrees and come or, or 180 up on the on one wheel on the wall and hey. No, they have to. And so Dave was able to take and you watch the video and it's crazy, dude. I don't I don't I don't I don't know how to think like that. He knows how to build bowls and things like that. And he knows how to how to make wood do that. And he made this quarter pipe like slanted. So it went into the wall like crazy. And and the way yeah. that the position had to do it is that you can't let it compress too much. The motorcycle has to, will almost bounce you out, you know? Yes. So so we did this whole like crooked quarter pipe you know what i mean <laughs> insane yeah so so there was a lot of there was a lot of really cool ideas i mean everybody everybody brought ideas to the table you know laban laban would throw in his his ideas and and uh he he, he had he is a visionary as well he could see it those guys knew how to make videos they knew how yeah. to they knew how to do it they knew how to like what it took to do it all you know, definitely. So that being said, if you had to rate your top episode or top episodes as far as like being how fun they were to shoot, what would your favorite be? We did um, in season three, I think. Can't remember season three or season four. We flew out to Florida and did the fluke tog, the Red Bull fluke tog. Yes. Jump off the pier. Yeah. With a flying device, mm. you know, and and that one, I remember like telling him when we got there, like, no, I'm not gonna do that. No, you know what I mean. And Aaron Bostrom standing right there, he's like, I'll do it. Let me do it. I'll do it because we built this quarter pipe that's six feet tall that I'm supposed to stand on, and it's on bike wheels, and four guys are gonna push this thing, and I'm standing on top of it, holding on to this hang glider. <laughs> it's like 16 feet wide, four feet wide this way, you know, and it's wrapped with mylar or plastic or whatever, built out of PVC or something, right? And I'm supposed to hold on to this thing, and they're going to push me off this 30-something foot pier. And I'm six feet above that, so I'm almost, you know, my eye level is over 40 feet, right? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like no, I'm not going to do it. There's no way. That's, I'm, I'm not <laughs> And, uh, <clears throat> and then at the last minute, I just changed my mind, and I was like, I have to do it. Like I'm, I'm supposed to, this is supposed to be my, my deal. Like I can't let Aaron do it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. And I remember being like being up on this thing and all these guys pushing me and I'm just so mad at Aaron screaming at him. So pissed because I was about to just die, you know, <laughs> me this thing and I floated down and landed. I was just like, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I remember that one being, being kind of crazy. Um, you know, the, the first couple seasons, the stuff was, was smaller. The, the wakeboard, the wake skate one with the genie. Do hmm. you remember the genie? Very vaguely. So it's like a 20-foot tall genie, right? And he's holding his arms up like this. And we built a ledge. So his, his arm spans like 12 feet. Oh. At a, right? So it's like 12 feet wide. He's 20 feet tall. But you can break him in half, so you can do a ten foot tall guy. You don't remember that one? It was cool. We took it. No, to I don't remember. That was season three. Season two. Season so we, two. We took the genie up to the top of the um, mega ramp, and Bob did like a no stall fakie on it. Like yes. Two, okay. Ten feet up. I remember Bob doing the no stall fakie. And then we took it to, we took it to Batakitas Lagoon in Carlsbad. And we built an above-ground swimming pool mm. out of 
plywood and two by fours. I don't know how it held. And we lined it with plastic. This was again all Dave. Because I was sitting there saying the whole time, this is never going to work. This is never going to work. This is like, we brought like 40 sheets of plywood. It was four feet deep. So we did lining the whole thing. It was big, 40 feet long by like, I don't know, 12 feet, 16 feet wide. Like it's a big pool, four feet deep. And it was right on the edge of the lagoon. And then so you get in this pool on your wake skate and there's a, I think we had a jet ski out in the water and he pulls him through the pool and, and launches off this thing and hits the genie who's standing in the ocean holding up the ledge. And it was so gnarly because remember he's 10 feet high. So he had to like Ollie, like probably, I don't know how high he had to Ollie to get onto it. He did a lip slide on it. He had to Ollie onto it. And then a 10 foot drop into like narrow water. <laughs> In a narrow water, dude. Like it was insane, and he tried it so many times. He finally got it. I wish I remember his name, Nick something. Yeah, wow, that was that was legit. And then we took it and set it up full height, twenty feet high in the snow, up on June Mountain. Wow. And snowboarders hit it. Yeah, up these massive jumps, and they hit a twenty foot tall ledge on it. And then yeah, yeah, that one that was a cool one. That sounds so cool. Speaking of snow. That snowboard episode you guys did where you put a bunch of snow on the, the Red Ranch. Yeah. Was that fun? That looked incredible. That was pretty cool. That was that was a unique, that was a, a definitely a unique thing. That was pretty cool. It was warm out. It didn't last long. But yeah. People were creeping up the driveway like, what is going on here? Seeing snow. Yeah. That was a cool one too. Yeah, I, but I, I forget most of them. I really do. Like a lot of the stuff was just one day. You know, and and I don't I don't know I I forget a lot of them, but they come no, back. I don't know. Yeah. So what would so those were some of your favorite episodes? What would be one episode that you really didn't like for one reason or another? You know, dude, definitely probably would be in season four, but uh, when I broke my leg, that was uncool. So what was what was the story behind that? A music episode. And so in season three and season four, we, you know, on season four, especially, we kind of, Dave wasn't involved in it anymore. And, and they, uh, I don't know, dude, the idea is just kind of, I don't know, it wasn't as, it wasn't as cool. But I um, think, you know, things just kind of grew into something else. There was like 10 people on the crew for building, you know what I mean? Or I don't know how many people there were. There's a bunch of people it just turned into this whole other, other thing where it was like season one and two is me and Dave. You know what I mean? Struggling, trying to find anyone who could come and skate. You know what I mean? Like, we just built this thing. We're trying to get something. And so, you know, Ronson Lambert and Kyle Leeper and would, like, you know, help us out and come out and ride this shitty stuff that we built. But, it, but yeah, so back then it was just like, we just got to do it, you know? And so then and by the end of it, there was like, it was just kind of blown out, you know, like so many people. It was cool. A lot of guys were cool. but. Um, it was different, you know. Did it kind of so, lose the the intimacy that you guys had at the beginning? Yeah, there was just yeah, there's something something else, you know. It just kind of, you know, took its natural course, I guess. I don't know. What do you think would have like prolonged the show? Probably get a new host. <laughs> no. <laughs> you think you, probably, you were probably pretty good from the beginning. Uh -huh. Yeah, were you pretty burnt out by the third and fourth season? Were you kind of feeling your way out? Uh, you know, it, it's it's a, it's a strange it's a strange world over there. It's a strange world over there, and um, you know, you get you get a, enough cameras in your face and and the bright lights in your face, you know, and and uh, even though, yeah, there's things going on, you know, I don't know, dude, professionalism, I don't know, I don't know, dude, I don't know. You get into a bigger, bigger crew like that. Even in the smaller crew, we butted heads like crazy. You know, ego's a tough thing, and and I think that that you know somehow getting trying to get control of that is is a pretty good thing. You know. Yeah. You know. Do you do you blame yourself at all for some of the things that happened towards the end of the show? Oh yeah, for sure. But those guys were being dicks too, though. You know, all the way up all the way to the top like the whole thing is weird the whole the whole thing is weird and and so yeah i definitely do i definitely definitely do 
and 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 you know if you talk to if you want to get down to the to the deal you should talk to dave you should talk to laban if you want to get down to the deal you know that'd yeah. be interesting we'll have to see i don't know if any of them would even i fully take i fully take take a, a lot a lot of that a lot of that i think i do you know um but but you know it's it, it it is what it is, you know. Overall, do you look back on those times with pretty fond memories, or do you feel like maybe it was time wasted, or what are your overall thoughts on the whole fuel well, TV built to shred? Well, for for someone who for someone who didn't who who really, you know, um, like I said, those guys on the um, that would come out and skate were on the level, right? Those guys were good, you know, and um, and so for me to be able to be there, especially in the role that I had, is super cool because I wasn't on that level, you know what I mean? And building stuff either, I don't think I'm on that any level, any level. So for me to just be able to be there and, and, and share those experiences and be able to put some screws in is a really cool opportunity, you know what I mean? Now you know, you get into it and then you start butting heads, you know, and you start dealing with things and then that brings out other issues. I, I don't know, you know, yeah, then, you know, you could always be way cooler. You know what I mean? You could always be way cooler. I know <laughs> but, what you mean. But things get weird, you know, and there's pressure, there's weird pressures that come up, you know, and, and, and looking back, like I didn't have the ideals. I didn't, you know, and so there's that whole thing where I have to pretend like I have the ideas. You know what I'm saying? It's tough as it as it grows. It's tough. And being able to grow with it is a challenge and being able to accept other people's help and be able to accept their input, you know, and try to be like it's taken away from you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you don't really realize that until after the fact. And you're like, oh, this only lasted that long? Shoot. If we would have known it was only four seasons, we could have just been, we'd still be friends. You know what I mean? When things could be cool. Yes. Be the short little, little thing and, we, and not feel like, did we just get tricked? Did we have a cool thing going? And, and then did we just get tricked? Did the devil just come in and mess with all of our little cool thing? I don't know. Maybe it's the Illuminati, thing. man. Maybe they made it better. I don't know. It's but but again, it's it's really cool opportunity. There's no doubt, you know. And 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 for for me to be able to to, you know, I, at at the time it was it was everybody. We had uh, so many cool people, hitters on the show all the time, dude. Oh yeah, tons of them. All the all all of them, dude. From like BMX and motocross and surfing, even and you know like all that stuff. We had like tons of really really rad people on this show you know that really made it that that was just as important as the ideas is being able to have people to that can ride them and show you what to do with that thing that you just made you know and so that in in that regard it's like wow yeah what a cool opportunity definitely you know? what's one of the funniest moments on the show for you uh there was some there were some funny times you have to talk a lot of shit <laughs> And, and I don't know what they have because I was mic'd up a lot. I said a lot of stuff. There's funny ones for sure. Oh, 100%. Some of the little outtakes and stuff would just have us, most of us watching it just rolling because like the way he would cut it all together, everything would seem so structured and whatnot. And then you making like a, a wiener joke off on the side that it cuts to. It's like, what? That's what? Totally. Yeah, no, there was there was all kinds of antics going on and yeah, you know, it's it's like if we could have just gotten onto onto an, a, another page, I felt I feel like, you know, maybe maybe those first couple seasons where we were doing all that work, just us was more of a strain on it. But you start getting employees standing around, and and you know they paid us, and then we went out and bought the materials, or we paid the labor, or we, you know what I mean. And Dave would make a call: Do I want to have a second filmer here? Or do I want to have a tripod that I run over to and push record and run back over and get this? And so he, he would do that all the time. He would have two angles going all the time like that. You know what I'm saying? And so that so that he could like save, you know, and then we would try to get, you know, donated people 
to help us out and not have to pay them for their labor, you know, and like try to find cheap materials or free materials on Craigslist. So, so would it have been cool to just come in with daddy's credit card and pay six guys to just, you know, give me a massage and massage my feet. You, you, you know what I mean? And he's over yeah. there directing. He doesn't even hold the camera. Like, is that what you want? You know? You know, I don't think so. I think Dave likes being in the field. I think he likes going out and like harvesting from the ground, you know? And, and, and so that, you know, it was like, there's just a fine line there, you know, because you want to keep him like in his cool element where he can continue doing that, you know, not feel too much pressure. And I guess the same on me, like, I don't want to have to build that whole thing, you know, that whole thing's going to take me all day. My back hurts, you know, nice and to have a over skate here. It. and then skate it and then skate it. And then like, like the cup, the intro, the coffee cup for season three and four, right? Or I'm skating yeah. and I hit the rock and it falls and then they get the idea of the whole ramp structure, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Um, that was Laban. That was all Laban's idea, right? Because wow. that whole concept was his and we rented out, he, he rented out um, some gnarly spot in LA with a huge view, right? And so we set it up. And so, and so I built that with a couple, with Eric and Lambert, and then I drove it up there in my trailer, in my truck, and then I set it up for the snowboarder, and then we rolled it over, and I set it up for the um, BMXer, and then I have to, dude, I, it was 20 feet wide, and I stood the whole thing on end with this massive crane thing and then tipped it over and set it up as a quarter pipe. Right. So I had to do all that. I had to do all that. And by the time that got done, it was dark. It was like, I don't know, eight or nine at night. And then I have to skate it. Right. And it's a six foot quarter pipe with these sketchy, four feet wide with these sketchy things over here. And the best I could do was a frontside rock. The very best I could do was a frontside rock on it. And it was just like, oh, I'm so lucky I could do that. What am I going to do, an axle stall <laughs> for the intro of the show? I mean, just, just in a frontside rock isn't anything at all. Anybody who knows is like, come on, dude. And it wasn't even all the way sick, you know what I mean? It was just like, give me something. Yes. <laughs> and then I had to load that into my trailer and drive it home. Got home at like 2 in the morning. And then I had to do a shoot that day. I had to drive back to LA and do another shoot for Built to Shred that day. It was insane. Like, like so much, like, oh my God. The craziest, craziest days. The other thing was that we found out when we got there is you can't drive the equipment on the sidewalk because it's going to scuff it up. And so oh, yeah. luckily I brought, I had four extra sheets of plywood in my car. And you had to go and lay them down. The thing drives on it. Walk over, grab the two on the back, move them to the front, and drive it forward. And drive over like this, dude. And we did this whole move while carrying this 20-foot-wide thing, dude. It was And lifting it and standing it up. And I'm doing these little moves like this, tick, 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 like that. And somebody's behind me moving the plywood. <laughs> and that's like that, that right there, that whole shoot is like, whoa, what happened to that footage? That was so gnarly. Like the behind the scenes on that were just like, whoa, dude, super crazy. So I don't know. I don't know why we got talking about that. But yeah, no, that was awesome. I love that. So yeah, what, that what was one of the one of the worst slams on the show that may or may not have made it into an episode? Well, Duffy broke his collarbone at the airplane graveyard, and uh, oh, is that that and, satellite dish? Yeah, that was a bummer because I had um. There was these little tabs, like eighth inch thick metal that was just sticking up out of the wing for a tie off point. And they were just like, there was, I don't know, eight of them. There was barely any of them around, but I remember walking over, looking at one of the dudes, cause we had like six guys. And I was like, dude, lose all these. And then, and then the next thing, like 15, 20 minutes later, I hear Duffy scream. We come over there and he had hit one. And I was oh. just like, uh, I told you, you know what I mean? And that, so that was, and, and that was off camera. I'm pretty sure that was off camera. I, so 
I broke my knee. That was on camera. Um, Who'd you hit? I hit Adam Alfaro. Oh. I forgot his name. Sorry, buddy. But I forgot his name. Uh, but now I remembered it. Yeah, Alfaro. And so what it was was the music episode. And they made a wall ride with a tunnel through it. Oh. Like this tall guitar. They painted guitar strings on it. And it was like went to the That's sea. Sick really tall guitar thing, you know, flying V guitar or something like that. And, and, and you could go through the strumming part was the tunnel. Wow. That right? went through the thing. And so I didn't, I didn't, it was like a little course and, and I, I called out that I'm gone. And then Alfaro went at the same time he dropped in and came in and I, you know, we met in the tunnel and his <sighs> knee went into, into my shin. Ah. Uh. Back my shin and then chipped the bone in my knee. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. And and that one, I, you know, I went to the doctor and they were like, no, no, it's fine. You can go to work tomorrow. And I'm like, okay. Couldn't walk, you know, like, okay. And then they called me up the next day. Like, you got to come in right now. You have a broken bone. These guys didn't see it right. What? And then when I get there, they're like, oh yeah, there's another broken, like your chipped knee too. These guys didn't see anything. I'm like, okay, red. Um, yeah, so that that put it out. That was in season four. That put it a stop to the to production for like three months, you know, which is a bummer for everybody else. You know, me too, I guess. But but for all the workers and everybody involved, and it's like, oh shoot, what are we supposed to do? You know, so they were tripping out. Was that like mid season, or had it all wrapped at that point? Oh no, no, there was that was like that was like episode four or something like that. Wow, out of thirteen or something. Yeah, I think 13. You know, so. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, that was that was something else, though. That was that was a whole the whole thing. So that put a put a spin on it. And and then I it was just like I, it, it didn't really come back, you know, so I wasn't really able to skate. I went out and was like there for all the episodes, but it was like I couldn't skate or anything like that. You know, I, it was. I think that there's some kind of nerve damage that went through. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I remember going on skate trips back in the day after I'd broken, I'd broken both my wrists, but yeah, going on a skate trip and being just the filmer for this or that kind of sucks. It's not the same. Like you still feel like you're there, but ugh, yeah, I, I imagine it kind of felt the same for you seeing all the fun go down and you're oh, kind of you stuck know, on the sidelines. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those things. So the last episode, I remember. So that wraps up season four wraps. And I remember you had posted something on Facebook about how you weren't sure what was going to happen with the show, if they were going to take it for another season or two. At what point did you find out like, nope, it's over? Uh, yeah, the, the guy called me at the end of season four. They got a new guy. And, and yeah, he, he called me up and told me that, that they weren't going to renew it. And I was like, remind me when I was a kid with the soccer thing, I was like, Oh, that's cool, man. Good for you. Good luck. You know, it's like no hard feelings, whatever, dude, that's your call. That's your call, you know? And I don't blame him. I, I, I don't think that, I, I think that it had taken a turn and, and I think I was really difficult to work with. Um, and, and they don't, they don't really want, they don't really want that, you know? Like, like I've, I've thought about that before where they, you know, I, I wasn't really trying to be that. That kind of just happened. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of other people who are trying to be that, who would do, say anything they want and be totally cool with it, you know? But I was like, I don't know. I just kept it like, we're still out skating. I don't, I don't know. And, and so my attitude was, was not as probably, I don't work well with others. I don't, you know? Yeah. What, when did you realize that about yourself? Um, you know, I think I knew it during, I had to know it during, because I, I know people told me that, you know, during it, and, and I didn't really like, you know, it, it's, it's a hard spot to be, you know, because I'm supposed to be in charge of the whole thing, you know, on the, on the show, I'm, I'm like running it, you know, and, and if somebody's blowing it and I yell at them, then I get, I get called out for that, you know, where, where. Like, I, I don't know, like that time of the airplane graveyard, you know, like they probably didn't want me to be the one saying, hey, you guys got to work better, dude. You can't, can't like, 
not see stuff like that. You know what I mean? You guys have to have to pay attention. You guys are all skateboarders, dude. We need to work on like, you know, like that sucks. You just hurt Duffy, dude. You know what I mean? Like that's because you guys, yeah. are, they don't want me to be the one saying that, you know what I mean? They don't want me to, you know, they didn't want me to be that guy, but at the same time, it's kind of like somebody's got to do it. Yeah, seriously. You Did know? you feel like some of them would be, some of the other people working on the crew would be kind of standoffish with you? Would they kind of avoid interactions because they were afraid of being reprimanded or anything? Did you ever get that vibe? <laughs> No, no, because I, I wasn't like, I, I feel like I could get along with, with people most of the time, you know, I think I feel like that, you know, but who knows, who knows, there was, yeah, there's some strange things that went on in, in that whole, in, in that whole deal. Um, yeah, feel, sure. All kinds of egos going around, all kinds of egos going around, you know, not just, not just mine, because I'm butting heads with, with people that are trying to be in charge too, you know what I mean? And in a normal situation, maybe, maybe the chain of command would be different, you know? Maybe, I don't, I don't know. Do you think there's room in the skate landscape now in the industry for something like Built to Shred or a network like Fuel TV to keep producing content like that? Do you think there's room for that in the industry now? I would see it would seem like it because nothing's changed. The only thing that's changed is that there's probably more builder skaters out there, you know. Builder so much DIY stuff. The the builder shredders out there are are have have emerged and and there's a lot of them and there's so many rad like dude, you look at the mountain bike stuff that they're doing out there in the trees. Oh. You know, and like you 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 look at like uh, like these gnarly wave pools that they're coming up with that's minutes away from having obstacles in there you know what i mean yes. minutes away from just changing surfing and and like now what are the boards going to be like like who knows and and you know even robbie madison with that motor motorcycle in the water did you mm -hmm. see yes i did it's unreal you know and 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 that's i think i think that's interesting and i think people are interested in how that gets done and and yeah, all all the all the sport all the uh, sports or whatever you want to call them are, are are doing that, and it's and it's cool. You know, the bikers are going and doing their own jersey barriers. Like I don't know, doing it. And there's people that have been doing it way before Built to Shred. You know, all the motocross guys building their rad dirt jumps and stuff like that. You That's know, true. and and BMX. I mean, shoot, I was riding BMX dirt jumps when I was seven years old. Mm. You know, yeah, I think I think there's there's, there's some cool things and and. and yeah, you get the right people involved in it, and 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 you could have something pretty cool. And and did you see the BMX ramp that was attached to the hot air balloon? Oh yes, Red Bull, wasn't it? Heck, you know what I mean. There's just like so many sick things going on there. You're like, dude, just there's an episode right there. Where's that episode? Yeah. Where, where's that episode? That's insane. That's insane. Not, Red Bull has kind of like become the epitome of what Fuel TV could have been if money wasn't an option, you know? Yeah. Which is, it's it's weird that money was ever an option for for Fuel because it was owned by Fox. I, I, don't, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Oh, but you're right. Red Bull, you know, it, it, it's, they do some amazing content and, and yeah, there's some, there's all kinds of leche there. With the mm -hmm. stuff those guys have, they have leche for days. Yeah, if they could, you know, and maybe it is having having a, a host or a couple of hosts that that go in there and and can introduce it and explain it better. You know, to you know, because maybe sometimes those builders just it's hard, dude. Because I've done a bunch of little projects and it's it's hard to like set up a camera and you know and do this and then go over to the camera in the middle of the job and talk about what you're doing. Like, no, dude, I'm here to get my job done. I don't want to. You know, I don't want to mess with that. That's a waste of my time. You know, yes. Contents there that like that hot air balloon thing. Just like, whoa, dude! So cool. Yeah. So Given cool. the opportunity, would you ever do something like built to shred again if the circumstances were maybe different or maybe similar to season one and season two? Would you ever do something like that again? I I don't know. It, you know, I'm old now. You know. How old are you? Uh, coming up on fifty pretty soon. That's amazing, man. Yeah, so 
I, I would I wouldn't I wouldn't imagine something like that would come along. But I think that I think that yeah, somebody I think somebody could could definitely put something together for that. You know, somebody could definitely put something together for that. Maybe uh, you could be like a consultant or something for <laughs> something like that. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Consulting jobs are cool. I did one in Italy for the Point Break movie. No, uh, one. Yeah, that ramp. I don't know if you've seen it. There's a ramp on the on the movie off the boat and you can even see me sitting up on the boat in the background i'm chilling right there what yeah i, I went on i went out there as a, on a as a consultant to do this thing and and i ended up being a stunt man for it and everything it was cool yeah that is nuts is that like otherworldly was that kind of blowing your mind gnarly dude i built this ramp it was a four-story yacht and i built a jump ramp off the nose of it and so you were like 15 or 16 feet like normal but then when you go out at sea it's like rolling and doing this whole thing and so sometimes you're like over 20 feet high when you launch off of this thing dude it was so legit it was so legit dude i couldn't believe it um yeah that was that was a cool job that, yeah so consulting jobs dude that was that was awesome after built to shred the draft that was after built to shred and so Somehow, somehow, like, I mean, you can't, like, get those kind of jobs. It was insane, dude. There were so many people. Such a rich, rich uh, shoot, you know? They had so much money. It was insane, dude. But anyways, yeah. Does anyway. film like that kind of interest you? Is that, like, what, what have you been doing after Built to Shred wrapped and all the Fuel TV stuff kind of ended? I worked with Bob for a while. We are kind of neighbors. Wow. And, uh. I worked with Bob for a while in the Mega. Built, built. Um, I built those rails. Me and him built those rails, really. Wow. Yeah, mega ramp. Yeah, that was that was an early one when we built that rail across the gap. It took us a week. Every day I went out there with him, and we and we we would do some cuts on it, bend the metal. He would get underneath it and stand up and push it up with his back, and I would weld. We did that for a week straight. And we'd go up and try it. And he's like, oh, we need a little bit more bend over here. I'm like, okay, we cut, 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 push, weld, weld, weld. Go up, try it. Oh, you know, for a week, dude. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. And so we we bent that rail that goes over that gap. Yeah, that was legit. And then we did the one going up the step up, too. Yeah. Yeah, I did that one. That was so cool. Yeah. And aside from that, I'm just chilling, dude. I got kids. What do you do for, I guess, income, so to speak? I don't make a lot of money right now. Not a lot of income. These yeah. Days. You and the lady just kind of both pitching in to make ends meet. Do what you got to do. Yeah. I just did a um, demolition for two bathrooms. Nice. I guess. So still doing the construction stuff. Yeah, I guess. Uh, no reason. man, if it's what you got to do to live how yeah. you want to live, then it's what it's got to be. Is, is there any other like kind of work that you're interested in that you've thought about pursuing, or do you want to do more like ramp building type things, or what? What would you do in an ideal situation? I would just have money coming in <laughs> for sure. I would make better contract deals and uh, got money coming in. <laughs> In an ideal situation, I don't need to be um, Elon Musk or anybody like that. You know? No, I don't know. I don't think the world needs people like them, to be honest. No, I don't need to be. I don't need to be anything special. Dude. You know, you're special but just the way you are. It's cool having kids and being being with the family as much as I can. I think is important. You know, and and the little guys are only little for so long. You know. And it's, it's I, I think it's worth it. I, I can't think of something that I would want to do that would take away from that. So Joe Gratzer out there? Who? Joe Gratzer. Gratzer? Uh, -uh. who's that? He's from Idaho. Just an old old roommate I had from way back in the day. So I don't, I don't know but too many people from Idaho. And I get it. Idaho is big. You know. You know Chris like, Weddle, the the Weddle grab or the mute grab? Uh maybe is he in idaho 
Yeah, he he invented the mute grab, but he was never he was deaf. He wasn't mute. It was kind of like a derogatory thing. So that's when they changed it to the Weddle grab. But yeah, he lives like 30 minutes, 40 minutes from me. The mute grab was because he was a mute. No, he was deaf. He was deaf. It was like a derogatory thing. Yeah, they they called it the mute grab. Dude, I never knew that. Because mute, dude, I mean, Japan's are usually where I would take it. But mute grab was like my go-to. I never knew that bit of history. Mute grab was like my over gaps grab and just pull it back. Yeah, dude, that was my that was my go-to on on a lot of that. Isn't that crazy. That's a bit of history, dude. That sucked. That's a uh, yeah. That's like these days. I don't know if you're allowed to call it a mute anymore. Now that you tell me that. No, they've all kind of switched it to Weddle. Some people still slip up, but like Tony Hawk made a video about it. It's it's wild. Tony Hawk and Weddle are good friends. Hawk will like send him gear and whatnot every now and then like birthday gifts and things like that it's it's pretty cool so i've i'm not much of a grab person so it's never really come up for me i don't know why i got these stupid long legs and i reach in my boards kind of never been in the cards but yeah it's it's been fascinating to see that i don't know what to think about that actually because i i kind of like that it's a mute now i I don't know i don't know what to think about it but if 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 weddle doesn't like it if he's offended by it then that's not cool if he's come to accept yeah you know, if he, if he's offended by it, then that's yeah, then that's not cool. If he wasn't offended by it, then it'd be like, "Wow, dude, that's crazy!" Like, but yeah, sometimes that happens to people, and it's, it, they don't like it. They don't want to get stuff money. Huh? Yeah, wow, wow, interesting. Small world. Yeah, crazy. Oh, you're gonna try to find minor little snippets out of this thing, or what? You think you're gonna find? Or are you gonna use this as this? Is this our video? I'll probably this? use most of it as is, and then I'll put in like video clips from the show, pictures, whatever, like references we made that people may not be aware of. But yeah, I think we're good. I covered pretty much all my questions that I wrote down. Feeling pretty good about that. Yeah, I think it's good. But yeah, also I wanted to, as a like, thank you for doing this, taking your time. We held an event here in town, me and some buddies. We held a competition called the snake river and i got some merch left over from the event i want to send you something it's all it's all gilday and it's like high quality stuff but i got here i'll show you that i got uh, during the camera i got this this hoodie that thing's insane pretty sick or a uh, tripping for you we got a a baseball tee as well and then a red one or a heather gray one. If any of these tickle you your fancy, a, if you got a I'd large love to send you one. Yeah, the lar- one of those large ones would be sweet, dude. That gray one's probably sweet with the Snake River. That's cool. yeah. You want a gray one? Yeah, if you got it, that's cool. Yeah, what size are you? Large. Large. Yeah, large so and in charge. Have that one, then and, and whatever you got in large is, is totally cool, man. That's awesome. Sick, awesome. Well, once again, I appreciate it. I wasn't. It's funny. I didn't even think I still had your number. We must have exchanged numbers back in YouTube days or something. But I looked in my phone. I was trying to get a hold of your email because I was pretty sure you emailed me that video clip all those years ago. And I was like, oh, he's probably still in my email. No. And then I was looking through my phone and I just typed in Jeff. I'm like. What are what are the chances maybe I have his phone number? I don't know why some kid in Idaho would have Jeff's phone number, but typed in Jeff right there in the middle. It's like Jeff King. And I'm like, there's no way this is him. So I send you a message and you just oh so casually. You're like, oh, nothing. I'm just running some stuff to the dump. And I'm like, OK, there's no way this is the right guy. But then you reassure me. Yeah, that's this is the guy. No, no, so funny. Yep. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully you get a couple clicks or something. I don't know, dude. I don't. I don't think anybody cares, but you know, you care. You care. So that's cool. I care exactly. No, you, you'd be surprised, man. I was talking about this with friends on a Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. The topic kind of came up, and some of the things people were saying about this show. Like, here, let me just show you. Like, holy cow, that's a throwback. That show changed my life. Classic. A few, a few people were like trying to get a hold of you months back, but they couldn't, couldn't find your contact. Things like that. You'd be surprised, man. It's wild. I think, I don't know. I think as skateboarders, we're such a 
a niche group, even though skating's becoming like world renowned and very popular, we're still like so tight knit and in our own world and everyone else just kind of exists around us. It's wild, man. The the show really kind of gave us uh I don't want to say gave us a voice, so to speak, but it put eyes on something that means the world to a lot of us, just getting to be creative, finding your outlet and the show kind of normalized that and brought eyes to not only skateboarding, but all these other extreme sports and showed what's really capable when you have a little bit of money behind it, some people with ideas and athletes that are willing to literally put it all on the line, collarbones and all. Dude. And yeah, I just want to say thanks for thanks for all that, man. Thanks for spending the time to talk with me. It means a ton and I will I'll hit you up for your address and send you some goodies here soon too. Cool man. No sweat. We'll talk to you later. All right. See you later, Jeff.